Look with me in Acts chapter 10. I saw a detail there in my last reading of it that caught my attention at this time as I'm thinking about myself, my, my own uh, life and um, you know things that should be done and need to be done and realizing that there is a value placed on the families of those in the New Testament who are approached with the gospel and it made me think uh, you know, what, how is my stewardship with these things going? You know, when's the last time that I said something to my family to try and help them uh, to know more about God or to prioritize God? And, you know, sometimes there's not an opportunity. I guess that's true. Some people don't want to hear such things. That, that does happen, but, you know, have you talked about it lately? Have you done something about it lately? Is a reasonable question. What we found in Acts 10 that caught my attention this uh, on this last reading was how that the 24th verse captures this centurion, this Roman, here has called for Peter to come because, well, God told him to call for Peter, but he knew that God was going to send a message through Peter, and the record shows that when Peter and his traveling companions entered Caesarea, Cornelius was awaiting them. He was expecting them. He had called together his relatives and his close friends. Now, that's an interesting thing, that he knew there was a message from God for salvation coming, and that they needed this message, and he took that opportunity to call together relatives and close friends that, hey, this is a thing that's actually important, a thing that you ought to come over and, and listen and hear what has to be said. You know, I realized, well, it, it, it wouldn't be too hard to invite people to services. You know, that would be a thing. We are about to host a gospel meeting. We'll put together some kind of a flyer or announcement that will be distributable, I'm sure probably both in uh, paper and electronic format. Um, but you could just say something, you know, by word of mouth is fine too, but it occurred to me that Cornelius knew something important was coming, and he was expecting to hear this, and because of that, he took that opportunity to call them together, relatives and close friends. That's pretty interesting. It was important to him and he was important enough to them that they came to listen to this, but more importantly, God is important to them, and this is what results in the first people to obey the gospel who are not Jews, they're Romans. But it caught my attention, and I thought, is this happening, or did I make that up? So we went forward into Acts chapter 16, looking at, the account here of a woman named Lydia. They land at Philippi in verse 12 of Acts 16 and at verse 13. On the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, that seems like a good idea. We should look for the places where people are religious, are sincere, and looking to know something about God. I remember listening to John uh, Robertson when he was back in Wichita Falls some years ago talking about reading these verses like Acts 16, 13, that it kind of helped him to realize that he should be trying to get these studies with, you know, wherever he can go. If there's a Bible study that he'd try to go to it, if there was, a, um, you know, some kind of a school or, or some opportunity to attend a lecture or something, that he would try to get an audience with somebody. And uh, had a lot of different studies and things that came from that. It's just interesting that, well, it's true. There's a place in town where prayer is customarily made, and that's where they went. 
at Philippi. And a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when he, or when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, if you've judged me faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she persuaded us. But she was baptized, it says, because she was persuaded. She listened and heeded, heeded the things spoken by Paul. She and her household were baptized. Well, there's another family who have prioritized obedience to God, prioritized uh, listening to the message of the Lord. That's good. She is, you know, as it says here, a seller of purple. I, I believe that's the way that that gets translated. Which is to say she's in, she's in business. She's in trade of some kind there. Purple is an expensive thing used for royal and official offices. So she's in some kind of a business, but uh, the same as the, um, uh, as the centurion in Acts 10, you know, was an important person, a, a, a person with a lot of business to do. He nonetheless cared enough about truth and about his family to bring those two things together. And Lydia was the same way. She cared enough about truth and about her household to bring them together. And you find later, also here in Philippi, when Paul and Silas get imprisoned, and when they're in prison, the jailer comes in in the 30th verse and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, that is, the wounds they had from the beating they'd received before being imprisoned. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. So the message to them, he said, what do I need to do to be saved? He recognized his need before God. He recognized he was going to learn this from the apostles which is the same for you and me today. We also have a need, and we will also learn this from the apostles, although we're going to learn it from what the apostles wrote down, the Bible. But it's the same thing. And he said, if you believe in the Lord, you will be saved, you and your household, as in everybody can, can do this. Everybody can obey. And so he did exactly that. He brought them together with his family, all that were in his household, And they were all baptized too. They all obeyed the gospel. Which is interesting, because it's telling me that he had a priority, right? Lydia had a priority, even though she was very busy and successful. She was still humble and prioritized God. And Cornelius, the centurion, would have been very busy and powerful, but he was still humbling himself to prioritize God. And that worked. So I don't think that I'm imagining this. But then we go on to Acts chapter 18, and you find another account of obedience. Now, these are related now, the next couple here. Acts 18 is where Paul departs Athens for Corinth. In verse 1. It was in Corinth where, in the 8th verse of Acts 18, Crispus, ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, which is the same wording as the 16th chapter. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. That sounds like Lydia's account in 16 as well. But here again, a ruler of the synagogue believes, together with his entire household, Many Corinthians believed when they heard these things. Now, it's interesting because this is Corinth, and this Crispus has believed with his household and lots of Corinthians. But if you go over to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, Paul mentions some of this. And 
It's useful because it's telling us who they are and what their priority is. See, that's what we're doing here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 14, he said, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. Ah, yeah, I baptized the household of Stephanas too. Besides that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. Because that's not the focus. It's who baptized you? Sometimes people want to know that. Well, who baptized you? You know, like you owe them some kind of a debt or something. Um, or it's some kind of, a, you know, heritage or lineage or something. No, that's not the point. The point is obeying God. But it's interesting that Paul arrived, and one of the first people to obey is Crispus, and uh, Paul baptized him, and somebody named Gaius, ah, and the household of Stephanus too. You can see him forgetting, you know. I baptize none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say I baptize in my own name. Oh, yeah, I did baptize the household of Stephanus too, which he forgot about because it's not important that he did that. <laughs> and, uh, and as, you know, I can add, as somebody who has baptized a lot of people, I don't remember everybody. That's true. Because it's not the point. I don't have any power. I don't have any authority. <laughs> you know. First Corinthians 16, though, Stephanus comes up again. Where in the closing of the letter, he says to the church there, the 15th verse and the 16th verse, I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanas, that it is the first fruits of Achaia. That's to say, they're the first people to obey the gospel in Greece, is what that means. They've devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I urge you to submit to such people as this, and to everyone who works and labors with us. The household of Stephanas were baptized by Paul. Uh, pretty early on, it says, they're, they're the first people to obey the gospel in Greece, in the Greek city-states, including which includes Corinth. They know about this. Not just Stephanus, but his whole house are devoted to the service of the saints. They've given themselves to the work of God in that place, and the church at Corinth knows it. And instead of saying, you know, I baptized them, you know, I was the one who converted them. Well, no, that's not true. God converts people. You might be a, a messenger or a, a contact for getting people the Bible or getting them, you know, some, some instructions and pointers. That's true, but God's the one who converts people through his word. No, he doesn't focus on that. He focuses instead on the fact that these are devoted and it's known that they're de devoted. They now have a reputation at Corinth and it's deserved, and we ought to be thoughtful about that in the 16th verse. So that's interesting, too, that Paul, on arriving immediately, has some who obey the gospel, and he baptizes them, but he wants to distance himself from that to say it, it isn't about him. And I don't want us to take to make it a mistake of thinking that this is about family either. What we're saying is, for these people who are among the first to obey in each of their respective situations, <laughs> it was so important that they brought it to the attention of their of their families, and in these cases, their families received it well. In the case of Stephanus in particular, his household continued in the faith and is well known for that. And that is a good thing. There is something to be said for my influence in a family, whoever I am, in whatever family it is. As a Christian, you have influence and it means something, you know, your priority on God and on God's things, that means something to those who are with you. They may not let you know that it means something. They might even be cantankerous about it, but they see it. It's, it reminds me of First Peter. He says that 
Oh, even if some husbands have not obeyed, they may learn without a word when they see the behavior of the wife. That's true. It's very powerful. Your influence is meaningful and powerful, and you shouldn't underestimate that. It, it, does, it does matter, and it, it does make a difference in a lot of lives. Ultimately, I look at Hebrews 11, where we record this about, about uh, Noah, who by faith, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Yes, this man was warned by God about things that had not been seen before, which is what demands faith. But he does have faith. He believes in God. And he builds that ark. And you know, the ark is big enough for a lot of people. God could have made more animals, I dare say. If anybody wanted to get on, I think they would have been allowed to get on. But only his household entered. Um, nonetheless, his household entered. He, because he believed in God, because he did the work, made a vehicle by which they could be saved. I think that's what we're getting at, is that we as individuals are you know, God's inroads into those whom we love uh, and, and those whom we know and are close associates with and, and work with. Now, it's not about the voice crying in the streets, um, you know, or the stadium full of people or whatever. It's about those one-on-one, -on -one, you know, people who know you, people who deal with you every day. That's where you have tremendous power, and it can be used for good. You can save a lot of people. Um, yeah, I think of a brother, I, I won't say anything, you know, on my account, but I, I know a brother who obeyed the gospel and, uh, yeah, well, yeah. he blames that on me, you know, that <laughs> I had something to do with it. It's true. I did obey the gospel in high school, and we went to high school together, and he knew about it, you know, and he said that he saw that. But really, I didn't know very much about it. I thought he was not interested, and uh, it wasn't, you know, it was years later, five, six years after, five years after high school, I ran into him at a church of Christ somewhere. I said, hey, what are you doing here? And he's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> But he, um, the reason I'm telling you this is not uh, mine, but what I'm saying is I, I don't feel like I had a whole lot to do with that. Uh, it's five years later that he, he starts studying, he starts going, he's attending in this place, or in this city that I don't live in, it has nothing to do with that. But that brother, man, he taught, he taught people. He still does, but he taught people. His mother obeyed the gospel. <laughs> His brothers obeyed the gospel. His, his, well, his cousins obeyed the gospel. I mean, I, I can point you to, you know, a half dozen people at least. Um, and he's quiet and reserved, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it's kind of what we're reading here. Like, this was important, and it meant a lot, and... He took that to the people who were important to him and meant a lot to him, and, and they could see that that was genuine and that was real, and uh, so I still think a lot about him. Uh, but uh, that to me is the idea that we can actually be very effective in our teaching, even with, with those who are around us, without, without nagging, without, you know, jabs and attacks just but just being straightforward and honest about hey you know have you given this any more thought why don't you come with me you know 
and just stay positive? I guess we don't know in the end how it will go, but we have seen in these examples that you know, these people made inroads that allowed the gospel to be successful. And I want to take from that encouragement, not browbeating, you know? Encouragement. that No, that this could actually work, and it does work. Because the power is in God. That's why Paul said what he did. Oh, I'm very thankful that I didn't baptize very many people there. Lest anyone should say I baptized in my own name. I really don't want to see these factions and these divisions happening there. That's Paul. That's what he's getting at. The power is in God and in his uh, salvation. So today, are you a, a Christian? Are you a child of God? Well, the gospel call is for all, and that includes you. If you believe in Jesus as the Son of God, repent and put God first in life. Let us help you to be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins, as is recorded for us in Acts 2 and Acts 10 and other places. Today, are you perhaps a Christian who has not lived right? Repent. Let us pray for you that you can be restored to God in service. He does raise the dead, and things don't have to be tomorrow like they were yesterday. Things can go differently. Let's harness the power of earnestness, the power of a genuine concern, of a sincerity as we approach those who mean a lot to us and to whom we mean a lot that they might think about it. If today you are not a Christian, we have water prepared for you to be baptized. If you as a Christian haven't lived right, we stand ready to pray with you and for you. Please let your need in the Spirit be known now by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected.